For it. So <laughs> we'll talk about SSL decryption solutions. Really proud of this. We started uh, this project over several years back, and we'd love to tell you the evolution as well as all the use cases we address with SSL decryption. And just to make this a little interactive, what we'll do is we'll give you an overview of our SSL solutions, and then we'll introduce a concept, follow it up with a demo, introduce another concept, follow it up with a demo. That way, we don't just give you too much concepts and then all the demos in one <laughs> shot. So that way, it's sort of like we'll chunk it up. And as always, feel free to please stop and ask any questions at any point. That's the whole idea. So this is sort of like the need for SSL visibility. As you can see, when we started this project, we're looking at a lot of reports and Gartner, and a lot of them were saying 80% of uh, enterprise traffic is going to be SSL encrypted. So you know, Gartner usually, yeah, they always have a lot of hyped up stats. So when we actually did uh, uh, our own beta deployments and we talked to over 100 customers, we found that, yeah, the average amount of SSL is anywhere from 35 to 70%. So this isn't some analyst report. We actually talked to a lot of customers, and they were saying that. Why? Well, two words, IT consumerization, right? All your services are going to the cloud, so a lot of this... Uh, a lot of the applications are moving to the cloud, so a lot of SSL is the pipe, which is SSL. The pipe, the percentage of SSL in your pipe is constantly increasing. So for a long time, SSL was around 10%. So people were just ignoring it, saying that problem will go away. But increasingly, uh, administrators are being asked, if 80% of that pipe is SSL and none of your security tools are inspecting it, what's going on? What kind of inspection are you doing? And there is also this, uh, I guess we should hold Netscape responsible for it. Whenever you do SSL, you get that lock on your browser. Intuitively, somehow you assume it's all secure. What is SSL? It's an encryption pipe, right? So the whole idea is a malware could very easily use an open SSL library and talk to its command and control server. There's nothing inherently secure about it. You have to peel open the onion and see what's going on within that encryption pipe. That's actually disappointing. I, I'm disappointed in malware guys that th only 33% of them are I know. Well, I, mean, I would expect like 80 or 90%. That number really surprises me. Mm. That That's, number surprises me. Yeah, they need to up their game. That's, yeah, I think. <laughs> why would they not always use encryption? Like, you absolutely. call them out, Canada. You do that. Yeah. <laughs> as long as they're doing but it north of the border. It's surprisingly low. I just, it is surprisingly yeah. low. I think it should be a lot higher. And uh, we are seeing strains of malware such as on that point, ZS, et cetera, the latest ones, they are using uh, SSL decryption, but it's still kind of low. But I think we're just waiting for that big attack on SSL before massive investment pours, and it's always the case with security. So when we, so how SSL's been around for 20 years, right? How are the existing folks doing it today? How are they decrypting SSL? Well, on one hand, you had the web proxies and firewalls, they were decrypting SSL, but usually, okay, they're decrypting it and inspecting it for malware, or they were decrypting it and inspecting it for web vulnerabilities. Usually, they were, the main problem with that was they, was they were very performance bound. Turn that on, you know, your CPU goes through the roof. And the second issue was that uh, you can't distribute that traffic to a whole lot of tools. Then come the load balancers. For a lot of time, if you're an Amazon or a Yahoo, okay, wrong example, but let's say if you're an Amazon or an eBay or, or you know, a Google, okay, they have their own thing. You, you front end all your thousands of servers with these load balancers which do the SSL offload. So they entered this market too saying, okay, we have two load balancers each terminating SSL and you can create a decryption zone in between where you can put all your tools. The decryption zone is the unencrypted traffic. The problem with that model was that one, Everything, it's all or nothing. All traffic gets decrypted or not. And the second is that it's not very easy to distribute traffic in a load balancer because it's inherently a layer three device. So every tool you add in, you'll have to put a route between that load balancer and the router. I mean, we want the simplicity of a bridge, right? Connect it and keep plugging uh, tools. And then the third class of uh, solutions where closer to our vision, which is their dedicated decryptors which go about decrypting traffic. But again, we found that the interfaces is a problem. When you are trying to decrypt, you want to I mean, connect every possible tool because it's such a heavy operation. You want it to happen once, <coughs> send it to all the tools, and then you know, re-encrypt and send it back. 
So with that, what are the three SSL use cases which we are addressing? One, in the first use case, you have this client talking to the server. It's doing RSA, plain old static RSA. And since it's your own server, you have the key under your control. For that, you can just tap the traffic and decrypt it. But what if this client and server started doing Diffie-Hellman? Or let's say this client went out and contacted some server on the internet, like Dropbox, et cetera. It doesn't matter if it's RSA or Diffie-Hellman. In that case, you don't even have the key of that server. In both those cases, you have to be in line. So we have introduced the first solution, which is our out-of-band passive solution, which is, by the way, used by a lot of our uh, customers because it's out of band, so you know, you're not actually impacting network performance uh, back in October 2014. And the other two solutions have just been released uh, as of very recently. Let's do a drill down of the out of band solution. Very simple. Here's Joe going off to this internal corporate server. Let's assume that you're a data center and you have all these corporate servers and you have ma mandated that they use only RSA. Just take the key and put it in. And as soon as that uh, SSL handshake happens and then the RSA thing, then you just, you're, the key is being exchanged. Since you have the private key, you can just sniff out that session secret, decrypt it, and feed it to all the tools. Very simple, out of, uh, very simple solution. And it's out of band. The second situation is, what if I'm going to a server like Dropbox or Facebook, et cetera? The simplest analogy of how we decrypt it would be, I would give it, look, look at it like a relay race. You know, you have four runners. Think of it like the Jamaica team. I mean, just assume that's Usain Bolt at the end, you know, doing the last run. So it's very simple. We have four state machines. The first person comes, hands over the baton. The second person takes it over. Assume he puts a wrapper, encrypts it, and sends it over. And then the third tool, again, hands it over. And then finally, it goes on. So that's how the whole SSL handshake, SSL uh, man in the middle technique occurs. So here's the first thing. Let's say this uh, client wants to go to Dropbox. All we do is we decrypt, we, uh, we uh, intercept that session and pretend to be the Dropbox server, hand over that certificate. Then the next state machine comes up, and then we decrypt that solution. That's green. By the way, throughout this presentation, red would be encrypted, and green would be decrypted solution. So it goes through this sequence and this arrangement of tools. Let's say you send it through a web monitor or through an IPS. And they do all their you know, necessary searches. And let's assume one of that third runner drops the baton. Then nothing goes back, right? Nothing gets encrypted. That means that if they drop the packet, nothing moves on. But then let's assume that the packet is clean. And you know, he continues and runs and delivers it to Usain Bolt at the end. And he does the final run too. Dropbox, and then it's re-encrypted, back in red, and then it reaches its final destination. So very simple, what would be the use case? Let's say your employee was uploading some financial document in Dropbox, and you're worried if its company, uh, it's sensitive or not. Using this technique, you can actually decrypt it, feed it to all your tools. They will uh, pronounce whether this is malicious or this is sensitive. I mean, there are so many different uh, variations. So, so you're generating, are you generating some kind of a root cert on the Gigamon device? Because Absolutely. otherwise, when you do that man in the middle, everything breaks. And we're going into that right. in a lot more detail in upcoming slides. Great question. Excellent. OK, thank you. Absolutely. We are doing that. And how do we do that? So before I go into how we do that, let's uh, cover the key benefits. The way we have architected the solution was we understand that SSL while it's chosen port 443 for HTTP, there is nothing in the standards that mandates that it runs on 443. It's a transport layer protocol. It's over TCP. So we detect SSL across any port. That's the number one thing. The second aspect is what Gigamon has always been known for, so we get that for free. Basically, we have a whole range of interfaces. Name an interface, we have that. So we support a whole bunch of interfaces. The third aspect is quite hard to do, and we have tried to be very true to that vision, which is we want to make sure you decrypt once, feed it to a whole slew of tools, and then re-encrypt and send it back. And it's not as easy, because these tools could modify packets. 
Security tools have a mind of their own. They can generate resets, they can modify packets, they can remove an attachment. So you need to keep these four state machines where you take out the traffic, re-encrypt it, and send it out. So that part is hard, and we believe we have done that. And then the th fourth aspect is very strong crypto support. And the fifth is, fifth and sixth, we'll actually go in with a lot more details and demos, but we want to make sure that once you put Gigamon as the uh, decryption authority with all your end browsers trusting, we want to ensure that the security of the organization remains the same or actually goes higher. You have those knobs and whistles to turn that on. And finally, privacy and uh, privacy considerations are extremely important, so we have strong URL categorization. And I will delve into each of these topics in a lot more detail with a demo and things, so please, if you have any questions, uh, I'd uh, appreciate if you could just hold it off after the presentation. So these are the key features, but we'll go into all of them in a lot more detail. Let's go into the first technique, which uh, you said, sir, which is the man in the middle. How do we actually intercept that certificate and do it? Well, very simple. Here's, let's say, Jack, or, yeah, I can't say Susan because, yeah, anyway, that's fine. A little, should have had some more icons. But anyway, Jack, so here it is, and then we just go ahead and, uh, uh, first uh, situation is, how do we do man in the middle? So Jack's going to Dropbox. So Dropbox hands over the certificate saying, I am Dropbox and signed by digicert.com. So we'll have to take that same certificate and re-sign it using Gigamon. So how do we do that? Very simple, we have three options. One, if you have a lot of money, you can actually go to Verison and say, give me a private key which is signed, so you know every end browser would trust it. They'll give it to you. They'll give you a key pair and then you know, then you're, all your end browsers are trusted. A more common scenario would be if you have Microsoft or Entrust, an internal CA, then it generates a key pair. The root is already loaded up in the end browser, so the uh, private key, you just put it all in the Gigamon. And if you have a proxy in place, that key may already be there. Simply put it in Gigamon, and we use that to sign the certificates. The third option is, let's say you don't have a CA in place. Then Gigamon itself, it's very simple. Using OpenSSL, you can generate the key pair, a private and a public key. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that the private key would need to be placed in Gigamon, and the public key would need to be pushed to all the end browsers. Public key and certificates are synonymous. Certificate is just a stamp on top of a public key. So that's, what, that's the idea. The key would be pushed to all the end browsers, so they would immediately trust the certificate and think it's coming from Dropbox itself. We do three security checks, and we'll go into a lot more detail as we go into this, as, uh, in, in, on each of these points. The first would be, let's say Joe is going to two servers. One is signed by, let's say, very sign. And the other, si other is uh, signed by, let's say, Startcom or Vosign. By the way, recently, you always come up with these questionable certificate authorities who just because they want to grab, I mean, you know, get more money or something, they do things like signing star.com or something. You know, they generate certificates which can do a star.com. Big, big no. You know, you, do, you want to go into that exact granular uh, level. You don't want to, I mean, it's easy for you to just generate a certificate saying star.com, you know, it'll, it'll work, or star.cnn.com. It's, it's cheaper because you can, you know, put all your servers in that, but it's a big security no no. So those situations, uh, they get banned. So, what if the server ended up going to one of those questionable CAs? This is where we go into this, our own list of trust store and see mm -hmm. if it is questionable or not. The second situation is we will do all the CRL and the OCSP checks, more on this later. And the final thing is we'll resign with a primary or a secondary say, and I'll, like, I'll explain why this is important. Yep. Let's look can, at the... Can you go back to that slide for a second? Absolutely. So fully built out. And all these Thank slides, you. I think we should we can make it uh, available to the mm -hmm. delegates, right? Yeah, absolutely. continue. Thank you. Yeah, so feel free to. Uh, so in this case, let's look at the uh, CRL and OCSP. So here it is. Let's say he's going to Dropbox, and unfortunately, some incident happened in Dropbox. That specific server was compromised. Dropbox called up and said, please revoke the certificate of this server. So what happens is that in that case, when that server dishes out that certificate, we go and check with DigiCert's CRL server or OCSP. These are two techniques of checking if a certificate is legit. 
CRL means they'll just give you a big static list and send it to you. OCSP is more like a, hey, I'm sending you this certificate. Is this legit or not? It's like, uh, it's like one and one on one. Well, CRL, they just send you a list of certs and say, these are all the ones which we have banned. Go take a look at that. So we check that. We can do strong checking. And if we check and find out that this certificate is uh, clean, then we re-sign it using our own uh, Gigamon certificate authority and present it. But if the answer comes back that this certificate has been revoked, then we don't re-sign it. So the, the DigiCert CRL server, that's a service that you guys attach to? Yes. So All the uh, top certificate authority providers provide CRL as well as OCSP server. So when that one becomes compromised, that's when we have a big problem. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's so, a bigger problem. So when you're delivering a certificate back to that end user and it's issued by Gigamon, that's got to be in their trust store, right? So if you're, so how is that happening? So that happens in multiple ways. Uh, if we go back uh, a, a couple of slides, let me just make sure I, uh, so here, let's say Gigamon, we generate a public and private key. So the private key is uploaded on Gigamon. The public key has to be installed on the end users. Yeah. There are usually what, bra, uh, uh, what administrators do is they use GPO, which is part of this Active Directory, yep. I mean, you know, AD. So you can just push that certificate to all the end users. So that's all good for someone who's part of your organization. Yes. But what about machines that come into the network Visitors. that are encrypting malware? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do anything about those, right? Uh, in that case, uh, what will happen is that they will just get a warning on their browser saying, we don't trust this uh, certificate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. users aren't and afraid of that, unfortunately, <coughs> anymore. Right. Well, unless you've gone out, except. Unless you've gone out the expensive route that you talked about and bought yourself yeah. a, like an, yeah. a, a CA, that, a certificate that's trusted by all browsers, right? That's right. Well, that's or if right. you've. That would be the expensive route. So yeah. where you actually go and say, go to very sign and But it would prevent the browser SSL warning. Yeah. on non-domain right. machines, as an example. No, because you, you're still performing a man in the middle, so it has to, that, that certificate still has to match. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is with AD, you can do strong checking, saying that, you know, yeah. in my end browser, if this is not there in the search store, then do not allow the connection. You yeah, actually, you've made a, a good point, right? Because if you're doing the man in the middle, yeah. and the far end cert is bad, how, does, how do you present that to the user? Because you guys do the man in the middle, so your certificate to the user is always good. Uh huh but the one going out is bad. How do you guys address that to that's the That's how we, that's why we check with the CRL. So when Dropbox yeah. sends its certificate from DigiCert, we check first. That's the first part of the right. thing. We check and say, is it good or bad? And right. once it's good, only then do we. But, but, but what, what if it's, it's bad? What, if, what do you bad. do if it's bad? Yeah, what if it's self -sized? No, the connection doesn't go ahead. We, yeah. So, so there is limited situations that I have run into in the past where that's okay because it's expected. How, yeah. can, you, can you put exceptions in there to say, we know the cert on this far end is bad, like, let it go? If I <coughs> may pitch in, yeah, we do have the option to either do a soft or a hard failure. Okay. So depending on your requirements, you can adapt to that. But can you do so, that per domain? Because so like- an exception, like so, you do in so Firefox. internal enterprise, you know, if you put this gig on there and you're actually seeing internal traffic, mm -hmm. uh, most internal enterprises, a lot of their internal tools, they're not gonna generate certs that are valid for a lot of those internal tools. Right, self-signed. Yeah, yeah, they'll just be self-signed certs. So we do, we do have the option of, uh, you know, specifying what the user wants to do in that situation. If we come across a certificate that's self-signed, uh, depending on requ your requirements, you can uh, you know take that action. I'm going to show that in the UI itself. Like, uh, but, but can you do that per domain? No, not right now. We do it okay. across. We do it across. So we have a thing of self-signed as an option. You take yeah. that. That means we can. Uh, no. When you go so, beyond just the Active Directory enabled workstations that you can push out through group policy, and uh, Chromebooks are easy because you can manage them all through you know Chromebook interface, which is great for education. But if I've got Macs. I've got Linux workstations. I have appliances that I really have no control over, but they're still going out over SSL. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly, we had a number of uh, Blu-ray machines that took part in a massive attack because they were compromises, you know. The grand scheme of things is that on that, what was it, November 13th yeah. or something like that. A lot oh. of devices that no one knew what was going on. We just looked at the endpoint and like, there's no reason we should be attacking Microsoft. Let's turn this thing off and replace it at that point. Is there any type of approach to handle things that are not just simple 
Active Directory machines where we can push it out through group policy or Chromebooks effectively. Or more appropriate, the buzz were IoT. So you know, as mm -hmm. IoT becomes yeah. more prevalent, the Mac yeah. part of that is easy. Max, you Max will accept a search. Well, well, I think I think that's a, it's a larger issue. The issue <coughs> is that I have to get this valid cert that the Gigamon is using out yeah. to every device. And that's continued to be a problem for Sometimes. enterprises because it's not just a Windows machine, that's easy. Yeah. It's getting them out to every little tiny device. Thermostats. Yeah. Right, I mean, it almost <laughs> seems like the, I, I, and you know, I, I'm not super awesome at PKI, but you know, mm -hmm. there's gotta be a better way to do it, but it's a trust chain yeah. and we're purposely breaking it. <coughs> so, but well, on the I'm concern too, the stuff we can't control, things like I'm in a hospital, I've got plasma pumps, I've got MRI machines, I, I've got things that are important yeah. that I have no visibility can't put a root on. Cert it's, into it. it's a third party it, company embedded that controllers it. and things like that. And yeah. I want to because those are the ones where an extra level of visibility is is essential. Right. And if there's an answer for that, awesome. If the answer is there is no answer or it's a pain in the ass. Well, and the entire okay, the entire man in the middle direction. the entire man in the middle method of doing this has garnered some attention recently, even by US CERT, where they've released an advisory saying these products that do HTTPS inspection using a man in the middle are not secure, and they're in fact breaking HTTPS encryption. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's no guarantee that whatever you're using to do that is is validating the upstream certificate chain or passing those errors back to the client. So that, that was my question is gonna be, if there is an upstream certificate chain problem, is it just dropping the traffic or are you just telling the client and giving them the option? Like is that- false, A false sense of security, right? Like, hey, that's, it's that's good. That's you can do a hard- <laughs> Well, it's good or you just- Go ahead and pass that to my botnet. Hold, right? hold that question. <laughs> you know? Hold that question and I'll show you how we address that. Okay. Uh, that's, that's good. So there is, it's very simple guys, either you are communicating with the server using your browser or whatever IoT device, or you're communicating using Gigamon. So we are just in the middle. As long as we don't reduce the trust levels in any way compared to the original connection. Yeah, that's, and that, I think that that's the, the most impactful statement is, is we have to make sure that that's, that that's happening. Yes. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, and the way we do that is, one is we do CRL and OCSP checks to make sure that the thing, and we give the user thing. The th third option is you did raise a very important issue, that warning which you get when you go to questionable servers. To do that, what we have done is we have created two CAs, primary and secondary CAs. So what happens is that you could push your primary certificate authority to all your end, user, end browsers saying, trust this. And anything which doesn't fall, so what we can do is we can make a determination. Let's say this uh, user is going to Dropbox. Mm -hmm. Great, DigiCert, there on my trust store. It's trusted, go. awesome, I sign it using my primary CA. But let's say that same user is now going to some untrusted server. Could be self-signed, could be a whole slew of things. In that case, we'll re-sign it using a secondary CA. Okay, so so herein lies the question, right? When when you do that one, the one on the right, and and the little guy's trying to go out and he goes up there, that's self-signed. That means that Gigamon trusts that entity, but is that a good, I think that's the so root what of happens, is, is that a, a good more, choice for that user? There's a lot more to checking a certificate than a CRL or OSCP. There's, there's so many other yep. problems that's with that. certificates, right? So here goes back to the question of visibility versus security company. Is Gigamon saying that they're going to fix the security problem for you or give you the visibility? And that's my question from a visibility point of view. Choice. If you're not passing that information back to the client in terms of there is a problem with this certificate, then it's not really visibility unless it's just for your own IT department's tools. So I guess, the client, I guess the end host still needs yeah. to know if there's a problem. I would almost want Gigamon to just simply return a bad one to the client and cause that, the error message so the client gets an error message. And that's how this would happen. Yeah. What happens okay. is, let me go through this. So this primary uh, CA, that public key, you put it on all the end browsers. So what we'll do is we will sign all questionable certificate authorities or or ones which are self-signed with the secondary CA. So you will still get that error message saying, hey, no. I, I don't get it. So that way we, we have taken care of so, that. So to address one other thing um, where this break, I've seen this sort of idea breaking before. In a guest environment, we're, we're all guests in your building, mm -hmm. we're going through this SSL device, I don't have your root cert that you're signing all your stuff with in my devices, I'm a guest here. Mm -hmm. How do you guys address that? Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing SSL man in the middle, for me, I don't have that cert. So I've walked in, I've connected to your guest Wi-Fi. 
How do you address that? Uh, That's where you're going to get the untrusted. Yes, yeah, so every gonna time get the, I go to an HTTPS, yeah. yes, I'm going to get an untrusted. Yeah. Right. Or you no. don't. Or, or you, you isolate a guest off yeah. on a network that you're not looking at because you don't care. Yeah. So it's really a problem for doing guest traffic SSL inspection because you'd I've get in the way. I've seen it where people had that in hotels where it was doing an inspection. They're like, I'm seeing this message. And you're like, oh, they probably have you know, a man in the middle thing going like, great, fire up the VPN and go through their office at that point because <laughs> nobody trusts the man in the middle that you didn't put there. Well, I think your point's big, too. If it's a guest environment and you're going to have it segmented off in some way anyway, at that point, are you really necessarily? I mean, everybody's going to have. Do we their need own to case, actually trust that? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. I mean, yeah. There's so a flip way, side. True. Yeah. Liable. It is your wire, but there's a flip side to all of this too, and that's you'll see if you've been in this industry long enough. Users are trained now that when they get a certificate error, they're like, continue anyway. Yep. Yeah. 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 Advance. Yeah. Click the checkbox. Hit OK. Is, is there any point? So, but in at sending least that if they download that malware, we would have sent it to some, you know, something would have been tool notified. It, yeah. Like, hey, versus there's something him going, going and getting it without us. If, it'll just, you know, that's a fair point. Hit yeah. there. So there is a thing. Oh. Let's. Uh, so one simple technique we also do, you might say, oh my god, is that a lot of performance impact? Well, we use a clever trick where, let's say, you're going to Dropbox, and then it's signed by VeriSign, and we issue to Gigamon. And let's say the remaining 1,000 users also end up going to the same user. Mm -hmm. You can just dish out the same certificate. Oh, because so you already know it's valid. Because we already know it's valid, and we have created that man in the middle.